today I'm going to explain what I added to the wiki of the class, the website. And if you were one of the students who added to the class during the last week, remember that we're not on Blackboard. And the address is over there on the board, andreafedi.com, my personal domain, slash Mac with a K, M-A-K, or slash CLT362, the code for the class, and you'll be redirected to the class weekly, where you will find the syllabus, you will find video recordings of the class lectures, assignments, readings, lecture notes, lesson notes. So <clears throat> I'll explain what is new and relevant in the class website. Then I will complete my analysis of the cultural changes that contributed to the creation of a different mindset, which is the mindset driving Machiavelli when he composed, when he created, when he wrote that strange, unique book that is The Prince. And finally, I will introduce the first reading from Machiavelli himself, which is the most famous of his letters, the letter to his friend Francesco Vittori. Machiavelli was in the countryside outside of Florence. Vittori, his friend, was in Rome working as an ambassador for Florence. And Machiavelli writes him a letter telling him what his day, Machiavelli's day, is in the countryside. And for the first time, he mentions this book, The Prince. Although, following the fashion of the intellectuals of the time, he mentions the Latin name, the Principatibus, about princedoms, even though the book was written in vernacular and not in Latin. So, for the first point, I finally completed all the videos of the lectures that were offered during week one and two for the very first lecture from January 24th. Unfortunately, you find only an audio recording, an MP3 file, which you can listen to inside the class wiki, or you can download it and listen to it on another device. For the other five classes, you find edited, high resolution, YouTube videos that are linked from the class website. Keep in mind those videos are unlisted on YouTube, so you can find them by searching inside YouTube. You have to go through the links posted on the class website. And as I said before, if you weren't here from the very first class, or if you're absent for any reason, make sure that you watch the videos of the lectures that you missed. And in the future, you will find videos of the lectures on it regularly. And whenever it happens that you miss a class, please refer to those videos before you contact me. And then you can come on Zoom, come to my office hour, which is in Melville, and 3004 Mondays and Wednesdays from noon to 1 p.m. and discuss the lecture you missed but you would have already some idea of what was discussed and therefore our exchange, our review of the class, the review, the overview of the class that I can provide can be either shorter, faster, or focus on a specific point that might have been harder to comprehend. You also find the lesson plans for week three. I've announced the plan for today. On Wednesday, we will complete our analysis of pages from Stanley Bing's What Would Machiavelli Do from the year 2000? I will also talk about section B of a page entitled 
evaluated Machiavellian games, which it lists a series of popular cons, tricks played by con artists, especially at the expense of tourists. And we'll explain why. That discussion of cons and to what extent a con is a Machiavellian game, as opposed, for example, to a simple street crime such as a robbery, that will be the focus of your first written assignment. The instructions are listed at the end of week three. The assignment itself is due by the end of the next week so that we'll have time to discuss, review the instructions on Wednesday, discuss the particulars, and time enough for you to request my assistance, especially, as I said, if you missed some of the classes from the first two weeks. On Friday, as usual, we will have scenes from the movie. In this case, two movies will be discussed and short scenes will be shown in class. The first one is a very famous movie from 1931, Little Caesar. The second is an even more famous movie from 1972, The Godfather. Uh, actually, Godfather Part One. Okay. So we will discuss what is Machiavellian, what is not Machiavellian in the contents and the style of those movies in their representation of crime, especially organized crime. Now, going back to the readings from the late Middle Ages, specifically the short story of the knight, the snake, and the dog, the poetic episode of Paolo and Francesca, two lovers who are condemned forever to hell because they had an extramarital affair. And finally, the first novella of a collection from 1350, the novella of Ciappelletto, where Ciappelletto, a terrible man, a very evil man, the very opposite of a saint, comes a holy priest from France, from a French town, and convinces the priest by rendering a false confession that he, Ciappelletto, was in fact a saint. Through these stories, we come to understand the specific treatment of the context of a story, or the context, in the case more specifically of the prince, of a political situation, of a political incident, of a political crisis. And what we said already in different ways <coughs> is that, <coughs> that's, that's Monday, so my voice is, weakened voice is not trained to talk so much or so loud. What we said multiple times is that in the first two texts, the context itself and the particulars of the context are just a pretext. A pretext to teach the reader some kind of universal, universal law that pertains to behaviors and practices in society, or more specifically in both instances, within a family or within a marriage, right? Because the story of the knight and the dog, where the dog unfortunately dies, see the nice tomb that I gave the dog? Okay. The law that we are supposed to extrapolate from this story is that men such as this aristocrat from Rome must never, must never what? How can you complete that? And, and again, we're talking about the misogynistic context of medieval culture. Must never trust women, entrust women with the 
responsibility, the sole responsibility of important things such as the safety of the little baby, right? So it doesn't really matter what the context is because you can think of an infinite number of other examples or variations where the law remains immutable. That law is considered universal, is considered to be true no matter what the situation is, no matter what the particulars of the situation are, no matter what that situation is, you must never let women take leadership within the family, within the house, etc., etc. In the case of Paolo and Francesca, Francesca being married to Paolo's brother Gianciotto, who was supposedly, according to the commentators, older, uglier, and had a disability, was limping when he was walking. Paolo and Francesca instead are both young, beautiful, educated. They both have a noble spirit. Why not for them come to experience what true love is about when Francesca was forced to marry Gianciotto in an arranged marriage? Well, regardless of the circumstances that I just listed, the fact that Paolo and Francesca are by far a better match for each other, regardless of the circumstances in the context, you're supposed to extrapolate a moral law which will tell you, you must always, regardless of your circumstances, whether or not you're happily married, married in an arranged marriage, whether or not you have by your side someone who is a better match for you, such as Paolo was for Francesca, you must always remain faithful. You must always obey the laws of marriage, right? That's the universal law that dominates over the particulars of this context. Finally, you have the story of Ciappelletto. Ciappelletto is this kind of pathological criminal who does a lot of things that are wrong or illegal and sometimes does them not for a profit, but because he does them even for free because he enjoys the experience of lying, cheating, beating up other people, etc. And that's why that would be the definition of the opposite of a saint, although for my iconic representation, I put a, a, a cross, uh, an upside down cross, because he would be better defined as a kind of anti-Christ. And I'll explain why. So Ciappelletto is this terrible man, and he finds himself in a situation where he is dying, and the events surrounding his death, whether he doesn't render any confession before dying, or whether he confesses his sins, might endanger the business activities of the two Florent, the two Italian merchants who have been uh, housing him and ultimately also would endanger the business of his boss. He opts for a more creative solution. He manages to convince a very holy priest from this French town that he is some kind of minor saint. As, as a saint, he will be remembered by the Frenchman from that town. What do we learn? What are we supposed to learn from the story? There is no must never, there is no must always. The story is not telling you that you must always cheat or lie to win. Because the story itself tells you that Ciappelletto becomes the hero of the story simply because he did what he had to then and there, in that particular situation. So instead of going from a particular context to the higher level of a universal law, you have a context where the particulars are so relevant that what Chapelletto did, 
which is of course part of a story that is supposed to be very ironic, cannot, should not be imitated unless the circumstances are exactly those. Because for example, if you remove simply the event, the event of Chapelletto's death, then the strategy deployed by him will simply not work. Because one of the reasons, and possibly the primary reason, why the holy priest from this French town believes Chapelletto to be sincere, is that Chapelletto is about to die and eventually dies. And as I said, in the context of a religious society, where of course there are sinners, there are plenty of people who are not practicing the rules of the faith, who are not behaving like saints. That's normal, that's to be expected. The priest would not be easily conned, easily convinced by anyone, because anyone can lie. However, in this society where you may have a lot of sinners, but you don't have atheists. And as I said, we don't know, we don't really have evidence of people being atheists during the Middle Ages, at least not in any open kind of way. It's not until the 1500s where we find some documents. In a society where even sinners believe in the existence of God and therefore believe in the existence of eternal punishment in hell, they would have no reason whatsoever to lie in a big way. They might lie in a small way, right? <laughs> Again, you don't expect even a medieval uh, person and, and someone who has sinned to render a comprehensive confession, but not to lie about the whole thing, to build an entire edifice, an entire castle of lies during their final confession. So. Even if you just remove the, the event of the death, the confession, the false confession is not believable any longer. And of course I said, the primary reason the priest believes chapter Leto's false confession is that he indeed dies. So it seems like an impossible prank because he would endanger his soul and his destiny in throughout eternity would be a destiny of pain and punishment in a very real corporeal kind of hell, right? And, and think of medieval frescoes or even 15th and 16th century frescoes where you do have the devils with forks uh, piercing the skin of the bodies of the people being uh, punished in hell and, and you have real fires that, that burn those souls, right? They, they retain their per physical perception even in the afterlife. The other reason why the priest believes Chapelletto and why Chapelletto is such a skilled con artist is that instead of saying, Father, I was a, such a good man, I was practically a saint, Chapelletto does the opposite. Like any other good con man and in, in, in the spirit, in alignment with the classical definition of a con artist, the thief is someone who takes your money, the con artist, the con artist is someone who gives you their money to gain your trust. Chapelletto says, priest, father, there is no way you can forgive me no way you, I, I can deserve, I'm deserving of an absolution. So he issues a challenge, and faced with this challenge, the priest does what anyone would do. He reacts by saying, well, maybe I, I will. I, I'll be the judge of that. And time after time, example after example, the terrible sins that Chapelletto confesses to are in fact indirect proof and evidence of his incredible, extraordinary Christian sensitivity and uh, cast a light on his alleged Christian practices. 
and how they were incorporated in this life. So in this case, the then and there, the necessity of the strategy are such that the context is primary and whatever you try to extrapolate is not as simple as you must never trust women, you must always be faithful uh, to your spouse. It's something that is more dynamic in nature. In here, the first story, the second story, you can get a universal law, a universal rule, a universal set of practices out of them. From, from this one, you, you get a process, really. You cannot just imitate chapter lit. Okay? Whereas the assumption for the proper medieval culture is that imitation is, uh, can be a successful strategy. And imitation, of course, the models for social and individual imitation are, first of all, Jesus, and the imitatio Christi is one of the principles of religion and life in general, the imitation of Christ. And secondary, secondarily, you are supposed to imitate the saints. Okay? So very easy to do. In here, you have more of a complex process. You have the acknowledgment that Chapelletto's con, Chapelletto's game worked because the conditions were such that determined his success, the successful deployment of that particular strategy. That is to say, if you look at the context in which he played that prank, then you find that the boundaries of that context were pretty strong. That is to say, it is easier for him to be successful to con the priest because it's a game that is played between the two of them because the priest within the confines of space and time Chapelito is about to die he renders a confession he will die the next day Chapelito, if you remember just came recently to that French town nobody knows him Nobody's know, nobody knows somebody who knows him, really. And within those confines of space and time, there is no recourse for the priest to more information, connections that might illuminate what the profile, the real human profile of Chapelletto was, right? It's about the two of them. It's about one versus the other. Same for Chapelletto in terms of space and time. He has no alternatives, right? He, he cannot play a different kind of game. He cannot use force or violence because he is sick and because he has no accomplices there. And we know that he used violence and force also and had accomplices in his past life in Paris. But now he's not in Paris anymore. He's far away from Paris. And Chapelletto knows that he is about to die, that he has very little time, and therefore he does that. Now, why would Chapelletto do that without no real benefit to him? Well, that's why I'm suggesting that rather than looking at him as the opposite of a saint, and he has more, many of the qualities that are opposite to a typical saint such as St. Francis. St. Francis was known for fasting for weeks, in, in the way that Jesus did. And Chapelletto is the opposite because he drinks and eats in uh, extraordinary amounts of food and alcohol, for example. But he's better defined and understood as the Antichrist because in the same way that Christ didn't have to die on the cross, but he did and saved humanity, humanity that didn't deserve to be saved, this man in this ironic story, ironic novella, does something for other people, his business partners, who don't deserve to be <laughs> receiving this kind of favor, 
then he does that freely and willingly just because it is in his nature. And of course, this nature is that of someone who likes to win, someone who uh, likes a challenge, someone who likes a prank, because the prank itself is presented as an intellectual challenge. So in some ways, uh, especially from the literary side of the story, you can understand that Chapelito's con false confession that makes him into a saint is his life's masterpiece, right? It's a monument to his crafty mind, right? And his ability to manipulate and influence other people. But going back to the context, we really have to go deeper and deeper into the context to understand the laws, the lessons that we are supposed to extract from it. We understand the context better here, and especially in the case of Machiavelli's examples from the prince, if we consider the context similar akin to an ecosystem. Because within this ecosystem, which is the bedroom where Chapelletto is dying, the French town where nobody knows him, the place where he is confronted by the holy priest, you have skills that you can assign to each competitor in this game, to each player in this active in this ecosystem. In the case of the priest, it's essential to know that he is indeed a holy priest. And you might think, why wouldn't Chapeleto call in someone who's weak as a priest, not very good? Because allegedly, this kind of priest would be easier to come. Why have the specific instructions given by Chapeleto to his house guests Go and fetch me the, the best, the holiest priest. Because at least he knows exactly the profile of his opponent. Okay? And he can match his game, tailor his game on that kind of profile. Someone who has lived as best they can a holy life, somebody who knows the scriptures. And by the way, there is an underlying <laughs> discussion uh, that is referred to in here because in the culture that the late Middle Ages are transitioning into, which is the culture of humanism, and in some ways the author Boccaccio is indeed a humanist or a proto-humanist, there is this uh, debate about the Bible. What are you supposed to learn from the Bible? And in the culture of humanism, everything is about human nature. So even the Bible, if read correctly, can be read as a historical text that will provide you with insights about human nature. Whereas the medieval way of reading the Bible, which is what the priest is doing, because he's a failure a knowing man, clearly, is reading the Bible to know not about man and human nature, but about God, about salvation, about eternity, about Jesus, etc. And that's why he knows the Bible very well, but he doesn't know man well enough, and therefore is easily conned by Chapulito. So there are skills that you have to put into the system. The priest knows a lot about the Bible, not enough about man hasn't learned that lesson from the scriptures. Chapelletto knows a lot of, about man. Also, Chapelletto knows a lot about language, about using language, and using language to influence the result of a transaction is the key, the essential skill of merchant. And this book, The Decameron, is a book where merchants are heroes. And therefore, if Chapelletto wins, is, the, is because the skills that he brings into the game, the skills that nature gave him and that he developed through experience and practice, 
are such that he can overwhelm the skills of his opponent and defeat his opponent. And the strategy that he comes up with are, is a very good match for his opponent because as I said, instead of saying, I'm a saint, he says, I cannot be saved. Even you, Father, with the power given to you by uh, the, the vicar, vicar of Christ, the Pope, by God himself, even you cannot save because I cursed at my mother, because I broke my fast and felt such pleasure, such delight at uh, eating again, and, 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 and on and on and on again. So, what is the only lecture, the only lesson you can extrapolate that you could do what Chapelletto did. If the circumstances in your context or ecosystem are exactly the same, or pretty much the same. And keep in mind that you have this personal element of the skills, that is to say, in here, as well as in the case of the examples provided by Machiavelli, it is never enough to imitate a strategy, even when the strategy is a good fit for the ecosystem in which, in where it is deployed. It is never enough because you also need to have the particular skills, right? By a reason, I have a particular set of skills. You need to have the skills that match the strategy. Because if your skills are not good enough to play that kind of game, even if you play, re repeat the game played by Ch Ciappelletto in the same, in exactly the same context, you will fail. And that's why it is very much not a context, but an ecosystem. In here, we didn't have to know much about the knight who fails at rewarding his dog and the dog gets buried. In here, you don't have to know much about Paolo and Francesca, because whatever you learn about them, it's secondary, it doesn't matter. They, they are destined to spend eternity in hell, and they deserve it. And that's how it should be. In here, all these little details are equally important. And that's why I said, from this kind of example, you don't extract a set of rules for repetition. You extract a process. The process is the following. Define, identify the context of your game, of your strategy. Study the skills of your opponent. Find an opponent that is a good match for you. Find a strategy that is right for the opponent, is right as a fit for your skills. Something that you can deploy successful and then proceed. And if you do all those things, then you might succeed. In fact, you will have a good chance of succeeding. It's not certain, but there is a certain amount of predictability to the game you play. But it has to be played within a specific context, a specific context in a there, and it, at a certain time. Because even timing, the application of a strategy is key for Machiavelli, in fact, if you've read the notes on, uh, that I posted under week two, Machiavelli presents a lot of parallels. His ideology is similar to the system used by doctors, where a treatment for an illness has to be applied then and there at a specific time for the patient that you're trying to treat. So the treatment itself is not successful unless it is deployed in a certain way, at a certain time, etc. right? That is common practice in medicine. It was at, the, at that time as well, okay? So everything has to be timed correctly. You need to have certain skills. And if you don't have those skills, if nature didn't give you certain skills, if you didn't work on those skills, then just 
reading from the pages of Machiavelli about a strategy and trying to repeat it will not produce any kind of success. But it's all about these elements played out within this ecosystem, within this context. So it's like a chemical reaction of all these elements. And if you change any of the elements or you change the context, the result will change. Christina. What Chapeletto was doing there is actually still a pretty common strategy among Catholics, like like in confession, like you like sometimes uh, you like go to confession, but only like pick out your most venial sins, like oh yeah, I yelled at someone once, and that, but and of course the priest never actually falls for it nowadays because they're used to that. But it's, exactly. Yeah, not taking a context into account. What changes? Yes. I've been there. I've done that. <laughs> I, I was a kid Same. in Italy. I, I did the Holy Communion, the Confirmation, etc. Hated the confession. Hated it. It's had the to. worst sacrament, easily. Like. When I got married, I had to go to confession. I had not done it for several years at that point, but I had to because of the sacrament of, of matrimony. Okay. Maybe okay. you tell you when was the last time you did it. Yeah. It's like, it's been a few decades. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, you don't have decades oh, yeah, on, decade, on your like, body. That, was the case, you know? <laughs> that, that would be me if I went to confession now, for sure. I guess I'm confessing now, fine. But again, what changes in this case is the context, because it is the final confession. So, you might do that, or at the last moment, taken by sheer, as Blaise Pascal said, what if God existed? And I have to work on that assumption because the results could be disastrous, right? And therefore, within that context, the priest doesn't expect to be pranked in that way because the guy actually dies. And who would do that if they're not like the Antichrist because atheist is not even a possibility in the mindset of the priest? Because he's committed to his own. Sin is, but not atheist, somebody who says, I don't care because I know God is not there. There is no hell, there is no heaven, etc. I'm sorry. If nothing else, he's a committed actor. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, also, also. But then, of course, as I said, what are the skills of this new kind of hero? And there are many novellas in the Decameron where the merchant is the new hero. It's not the muscular strength of the knights of the chivalric literature. The merchant is the kind of hero who talks his way out of difficult situations. And in fact, you also find interesting journals by Florentine merchants from the 14th century with their adventures and the many ways that they had to, they found themselves in a pickle and they had to uh, find a way out, right? There are journals such as the Journal of Bonacorso Pitti in Florence from the Pitti family uh, that built the initial palace where you find the museum, uh, the Pitti Museum in Florence, and surrounded by the beautiful Boboli Gardens in, in the back. He goes to Hungary for a deal. He has to buy horses and bring them back to Italy. And then he falls sick. He's sick several weeks. He barely survives. But at that point, because of the money spent for his own care, in a, in a foreign country, he doesn't have enough money to buy those horses, so he puts up a casino. He uses the remainder of his money as the bank for a game of, of dice or cards, I don't remember the particulars, makes enough money because, of course, the, the, the casino always wins in the end. Mm -hmm. And with the money, buys those horses, comes back to Italy. So, those were the, the successful merchants of the time. It was a period of wild capitalism, right? You had to gamble your way. And that was Hungary. You can imagine the kind of difficult situation you might have found going to Egypt or, uh, what is, uh, or Palestine, what is today, Israel, uh, Lebanon, to get spices, to buy spices coming from the Far East, bringing them home, okay? Uh, a lot of uh, uh, potential difficulties. So with this in mind, let's go back and examine the example I faced at the beginning. So what is the issue with someone cheating their way into the garage when there is a sign that says the garage is full, monthly passes only, and you have uh, someone who just presses the button, gets the ticket, and goes in? The problem, you can imagine, 
uh, you can uh, address this, analyze this from many different points of view. But the main problem is that the context is different. This is a closed context. It's just Chapelito and the priest. Where are the possibility of an intrusion? Intrusion would mean, oh, by chance, randomly, someone walks into this French town and says, whoa, Chapelito, you bastard. I know you, you piece of ass, you a-hole. And the priest says, wait, 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 wait a minute. You, you know this guy? Tell me about it. Other than that, the context is pretty much closed. And within that context, you can successfully gain control the of the game. What, the, the version you just did there was the Martin Scorsese version. <laughs> That's how it would have played out in a Scorsese movie. Probably, yeah. Probably, yeah. With, with the, the obligatory queer scene. Yes. Amount of queer scene. Mm -hmm. In the case of the garage, why is the context porous? And that's why I use this kind of line. It's more than porous. It's pretty much uh, uh, open as a context. Because in this context, what is control? Who are your opponents that you need to control to repeat this and enter into the garage every time, even when the sign says the garage is full? Because if you do it once, you can be lucky, but you're not being Machiavellian, Nigel. You need no opponents at all. I'm sorry? You need no opponents at all. Uh, no, I didn't. No one can be there because it's being you and the machine. Yeah. Great response. So it's either just you and the machine or just you and the attendant. And it's the garage of the university. That's never the case. There are people walking by who will see what you're doing. There are professors such as I was in that situation following you and seeing what happens. And therefore, there is a number of opponents that is too high for you to control. And what are the skills even to control those opponents? You don't have those skills or you don't have the force because it's clearly a situation where you can manipulate the attendant by telling him lies or by buying coffee, going out for a beer with the garage attendant. But how can you control the professors? Because professors are, are, are pedantic, right? So second time, third time, you, you can rest assured they will at a meeting say, Oh, what about the garage? I've seen so many students who ignore the sign, and I have the monthly pass, but they just press the, the, the button, get the ticket, and get into the garage. This cannot happen on this campus. There can be the campus police nearby, because the campus police, maybe you don't see the car, but they could be parked inside the dark garage, right? So the context cannot really be controlled. This is not a Machiavellian game because the context is too porous, the same way that usually you don't get robbed on Fifth Avenue. You may get robbed in an alley in Central Park at night or during the day, but under one of those underpasses, the bridges, etc. right? Because if the context is open, then someone can intrude into that context. Someone can call the police from their phone. There can be a policeman. Uh, or uh, a police detective in plain civilian clothes, okay? Let's go back for the last time to the situation of the prisoner's dilemma. Now, this situation, if you take the traditional definition, then it's pretty much a closed context. And therefore, there is no way you can control the game. A doesn't know what B will do. The police detective cannot control them. They cannot control the police detective. Okay, so nothing can be done if it is a closed context. However, it could be another kind of context. You can imagine that this context of the prisoners in a police station after they've committed a, a, a crime, about to be convicted, is part of a larger context. And the larger context would be A and B are not just simple criminals who don't know each other very well and cannot predict what the other will do, whether they will talk on them or remain silent, etc. However, A and B in this larger context are members of a mafia organization or any other kind of organized crime. Then this context is not as relevant because it, it's again, it goes from being closed 
to possibly being porous or somewhat porous. In that kind of context, there is the possibility of intrusion. You can either convey a message to one of the criminals, right? You pay a janitor in the police station who's cleaning, and he comes by the cell and says, the, the Don, the big boss, says, this is what you have to do. You have to confess, or you have to stay silent. Otherwise, you pay the consequences. Your family will pay the consequences. So this is one way to intrude into that context and change the outcome. Or you can get to the police detective, right? And call the police detective and say, oh, you have wonderful kids. I just saw them today coming out of school. Your daughter is beautiful. Uh, she will grow up. She will grow up. She might grow up to become a wonderful woman. And then you just influence the result. The policeman might understand that these are not simple criminals, that there is more at stake. And is it worth for him to risk the safety of his family for two petty criminals who just robbed a small bank or a jewelry store and, and decides to uh, play a game that will allow these two to uh, get out uh, without jail time or with just a short amount of jail time. And this is, of course, applied to the prisoner's dilemma seems kind of weird, but imagine this kind of double context <coughs> in the case of a shopkeeper in New York during the 1970s and 80s, or someone who had a shop in Sicily during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. And a goon comes by and says, from now on, every week, you have to give me $500, right? This is what you have to pay for protection if you want to uh, avoid any issues. And within the context of that immediate request, that would be the smaller context, the shopkeeper might prevail, might have enough control in one way or the other, right? The, the shopkeeper might say, here is my shotgun, go away. But is that really a way to control the situation? Not as much, because there is a larger context. The guy who came represents an organization that will send more people, that will kill you, that will burn your store, threaten your family, etc. So control in this context has to take into account the larger context, which is why also, you've seen it in movie, but if you read transcripts of mafia trials, you see in real life, the lower level goons are really stupid. They really have a low IQ, really. Uh, one judge famously said to a criminal, you're two bolts short of being Frankenstein. <laughs> Meaning, you're just big, big uh, muscle, amount of, of muscle walking, but not much of a brain there. Because they don't need to. First of all, a mafia organization will want to have, at the lowest level, people who are not so smart because they need to be manipulated by the dons into committing crimes, etc. And Second of all, there is no need for those skills because there is an organization that replaces the need for those skills. I don't need to be very smart because the guy in the shop knows who I am or has a sense of what I represent and therefore I don't need to be smart enough to manipulate or influence uh, the person um, I'm getting money out of that. Uh, I have five minutes to conclude. So, going back to politicians, why so many politicians are crooks? Well, some, because they want. Clearly, there is money around politics, so why not get into politics to make money? Some others, and that would be a slightly larger group, become crooks because they can. Because they realize that it is easier to get away with it the closer you are to the, the top level of the hierarchy. You're shielded from the consequences somewhat, okay? Because you've become an important kind of people. 
Both of these categories are Machiavellian losers. They're not true Machiavellians. And eventually, they will fail at their political career or get caught. Okay? However, unfortunately, a lot of politicians and politics and honest individuals who want to change society for the better, and then they become crooks because they have to. Meaning, the simplest example would be the handling of funds. Even if you are the best leader with the uh, most uh, pure intentions, or even have a real chance with your ideas at reforming society for the better, this will not come to be unless you're elected, unless you're elected multiple times, because one is not enough, unless you can create a political movement. Keep in mind, not your two-party system in the United States, but the European political scene, where from the post-war period on, a lot of new parties, new movements have been created and are still being created. But in order to establish a new political organization, you need funds. And a lot of politicians, a lot of leaders come to the realization at some point that they have to accept money, contributions for, from people who will ask them a favor in exchange, who are not so pure in their intentions or don't have the best and most honest profile because without those funds, their ideas will not be promoted and will not turn into reality as they hope to. Of course, don't be cynical. This is not what necessarily needs to happen, but this is a good explanation by Machiavelli to this phenomenon. You cannot believe that politicians represent the worst in society. Some of them may have been bad people from the get-go. Others do it because the temptation is too strong, and others do it because there is no other way. They, they see no other way within that context to see their plans implemented unless they have funds for their political campaigns, to promote their ideas for reform, etc. Um, so just the short as possible introduction, the, the one minute story about the letter that is part of the assignments that you find at the end of page three, that is from the one of the textbooks, The Prince by Niccolò Machiavelli, edited by and footnoted, annotated by William Connell. Uh, and uh, page 130 is where you find the letter from Machiavelli to his friend Vettori. This is the time, the period, when Machiavelli has lost his position in the administration of Florence, right? It is after he was fired, then his budget was reviewed to see if they could find anything. He lost his salary. He was making, at some point, 126 florins. Florins are gold coins. It was the dollar of the time. It, it was, uh, a, a, and, and those gold coins were a huge amount of money during that period. And Machiavelli then was jailed, suspected of trying to uh, upset the government of Florence and damaged the interests of the Medici. He was confined to his farm in the countryside. In the countryside, he had a couple of farms, small farms. And he's somebody who's too young to be retired and stay retired. And his farms are not very big. Uh, we know at some point those farms were <laughs> producing about 20 barrels of wine, six barrels of oil, some wood. That, that's pittance, that's, that's a small amount. It, it's, it's not enough, really, to live comfortably. And Machiavelli writes to his friend who is in Rome, saying, this is how I spend my days. And at the end of his typical day's description, he talks about reading books and then writing what he learned from those books, which is the book that will become The Prince. <laughs>